Sure, okay. All right, so my talk today is on cannabis and that it's not just for getting high. So before I kind of get into cannabis, because the, the real question is, is it real medicine or is it snake oil? And so enter Clark Stanley. Clark, Stan, uh, Clark Stanley, as you see here, made rattlesnake oil liniment. And it was good for a whole host of things. It was the strongest and best liniment known for the cure of all pain and lameness. So if you were lame, you could use this. Uh, it was for... Uh, it was only for external use, so keep that in mind. Rheumatism, neuralgia, sciatica, lame back, lumbago, I don't know what that is. Contracted muscles, toothache, so I guess you could put it on the outside. Sprain, swelling, frostbite, chill, blain, chill blains, I'm not sure what that is either. Bruises, sore throat, bites of animals and insects and reptiles. It gives immediate relief. It gives immediate, it, it for sale by all dealers in medicine. Price is 50 cents per bottle, and it's manufactured by Clark Stanley, Providence, Rhode Island. So we've all heard, ah, that's snake oil. And the question is, is cannabis medicine or is it snake oil? So I want to explore what snake oil, where that all came from. And in the 1800s, thousands of Chinese workers arrived here in the United States as indentured laborers to work on the Transcontinental Railroad. The vast majority of these workers came from peasant families in southeastern China and were signed to contracts that ran up to five years for relatively low wages. Among the items the Chinese railroad workers brought with them were various different medicines, including snake oil. This oil was made from the oil of the Chinese water snake. That's very important. It was the Chinese water snake, which was very high in omega-3. And of course, this reduced inflammation. The Chinese water snake oil in its original form was really very effective, especially when used to treat, you know, the common ailments you would get from working on the railroad. You know, they feel like they got the arthritis, the bursitis, whatever, sore muscles. So the story goes that the Chinese workers shared the oil with their American counterparts who marveled at how well it worked. Well, eventually, Clark Stanley got wind of this mystery oil and being the entrepreneur that he was, figured that he could make and sell the same thing. The only problem was, where could he get Chinese water snakes? So he substituted Chinese water snakes for rattlesnakes. There it is, Clark Stanley's rattlesnake oil liniment. The former self-professed cowboy claimed he had learned about the healing power of rattlesnake oil from Hopi Medicine Man. He never publicly mentioned Chinese snake oil at all. Stanley created a huge stir at the 1893 World's Exposition in Chicago when he took a live snake, live rattlesnake, and sliced it open before a crowd of onlookers. Of course, not only did these rattlesnakes contain much of the, 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 the valuable omega-3 that the, Eastern, that the uh, Chinese rattlesnake did, but they were also quite venomous. And as Clark Stanley was soon to find out, supply could not even come close to meeting demand for his miracle product, which at the time was selling very well. So what, made, what he did to resolve this was tinker with his original formula. And in comes chief chemist Harvey Washington Wiley, MD. By 1906, the Pure Food and Drug Act had been passed and tough new standards were put in place to prevent the sale of adulterated foods and medications. The Department of Agriculture established a poison squad headed up by Chief Chemist Harvey Washington Wiley. 
they con conducted stringent testing of a wide range of different products being sold in the public. This was the precursor, this, this, this uh, 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 Pure Foods, of the FDA, which we know of today, and that was, name was changed to the FDA officially in 1930. But because there was so much public demand and political resistance and pressure, it wasn't until 1917 when government inspectors finally seized a shipment of uh, Clark Stanley's snake liniment and conducted a thorough analysis of its contents. What they discovered was that Clark Stanley snake oil liniment didn't contain any snake product whatsoever. According to the official report, the bottles contained a rather bizarre mixture of mineral oil, camphor, cayenne pepper, animal fat, and turpentine. While Stanley was charged under the Pure Food and Drug Act for misbranding his product, all that amounted to was a measly $20 fine. Still, the government report helped to kill the demand for Stanley's product, the snake oil liniment, and he found himself out of business. But even though the scam was found out, he went out of business as a rather rich man and faded later into obscurity. So it's very interesting. And it's also, it, this is actually very prescient that in 1927, Harvey Washington Wiley, this is 1927, expressed his suspicions that the use of any form of tobacco may be or might be harmful and that it might promote cancer. Because of mounting evidence continue, uh, confirming Wiley's early warnings, Good Housekeeping stopped accepting cigarette ads in 1952, 12 years before the US Surgeon General issued a report detailing the health hazards of smoking. In his last year, by the way, he was the first director of the FDA, uh, he was fought and won, he fought and won the battle to keep refined sugar pure and unadulterated. He died in 1930 at age 86, and he was given a Patriot's funeral at Arlington Cemetery. That's a big deal. This guy was serious. And the whole problem, and you're going to see this throughout my talk, is that you'll find there's a lot of this in all of what I just described to you in the uh, snake oil world. Did I show this on the slide? Oh, Chief, oh, see, so you got a guy's got to tell me when I mess up. There's Chief Chemist Harvey Wiley Washington. Sorry about that, guys. So, marijuana in the 1930s was considered to be a scourge. You had wild orgies and wild parties or weird orgies. Uh, it results in lust, crime, sorrow, hate, shame, despair, misery you see as a needle. You see the woman who looks like she's got a cigarette, assuming it's a marijuana cigarette, and her life is just, is just ruined because she is you know, clearly going to weird orgies and wild parties. But when we talk about cannabis, we have to look at it from the familial and the genus and then to the various different functional and, hier and, and, and hierarchy and dysfunctional hierarchy. So the Rudacy family has citrus. And of course you go down and citrus can be sweet or sour. So it could be a lemon or it can be an orange. The Cannabaceae family, which has cannabis, can have indica, sativa, or ruderalis. But when you dig down to the dysfunctional hierarchy in that cannabis genus, there's hemp and there's marijuana. Really, they're almost indistinguishable. In fact, they are indistinguishable. The only thing in cannabinoids that differentiates cannabis from being hemp or whether it is marijuana is whether its primary ingredient, as you see on the left, is the 
the uh, uh, cannabidiol or the CBD, or if it's primary ingredients, which you, ingredient which you see on the right, which is the marijuana, is THC, tetrahydrocannabinol. So we all heard of that. That's the that's what makes you high. So if it has if it has a THC content that is less than 0.3%, it's hemp. If it has a THC content of 20% or greater, it is marijuana. And that is all that differentiates the two. Now you notice the CBD content in hemp is higher, double higher, but the THC content in marijuana is way more than double that of hemp. So to make this a little more complicated and confusing, we're gonna take two uh, species of, uh, of, of, of cannabis, and in this case, they are talking about THC levels of 20% or higher, so this is marijuana. Well, if you look at the sativa, they're taller and slimmer plants, and they, the leaves are longer and thinner. It gives you a head high. You are more alert. You are uplifted and euphoric. You have increased creativity, and it is best for daytime use, you know, like before you go to work. The indica, on the other hand, is shorter and bushier plant, the leaves are shorter and wider. It gives you a body high. It relaxes you. It's an appetite stimulator. It's a sleep aid. It's a pain reliever. And it's best for nighttime use. So I, I don't know if you see where I'm going with this, but where I'm going with this is that I see a lot of the same marketing strategy, strategy from Clark Stanley. It's for everything. And I'm gonna show you some more of that here as we move along. But it's not to say that botanicals or plants are not commonly used in medicine and that there is not real medicine in this because there is, and I'm gonna show you that. But you gotta think, you know, okay, just, just, just going through a very short list. You've got the angel trumpet, and that's a very powerful hallucinogenic, can be misused or, or, or abused, but that's where we get atropinus scopolipine from. Sweet clover, we get warfarin. Ephedra sinica, that's dual purpose as well as a decongestant, but it can be, meth, uh, 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 it's the base product of methamphetamine. The coca leaf, it's to relieve hunger and fatigue. They chew the plants or they chew the leaves, uh, but it's also used for treating nausea and asthma. Um, coca, tea, coca tea is used for altitude sickness in the Peruvian Andes and elsewhere. And then you have penicillium mold. Okay, so, you know, there's, in, the, in that world, we get a lot and have gotten a lot of medicines. And that kind of medicine is really well accepted, I think, uh, you know, throughout history as actually having value. The question is, is cannabis should it be used as it's shown here? Or should it be what we, the components synthesized? What really does work, what doesn't work? So again, you look at the economy, and economy matters. Hemp's on the left, marijuana's on the right. Cannabis sativa is the species. You see the psychoactive content, 0.3 versus 10%. The hemp is used for auto parts, soap, concrete. I'll show you some more things it's used for. The one on the right is used for getting high. That's its purpose. And look at the estimated domestic violence, or domestic market value, I'm sorry, in euros. 452 million for hemp, 10 billion to 120 billion for marijuana. And that's a big spread, but that's more than likely because a lot of it is underground money. Uh, but that's a, just if you just took the low number, 10 billion versus 452 million, just take that. And that's a remarkable, I think that's a 20 fold difference. So that's quite substantial. And when I told you earlier that hemp and marijuana were essentially indistinguishable from each other, well, here's a photo posted from the New York Police Department 75th Precinct Twitter feed showing officers with what they thought was 106 pounds of marijuana. But it, and they look pretty happy there, pretty proud. One guy smiling, 
Other guy looks like he's got two bags. He's looking on this, you know, holding them like babies. He looks, they look happy, but it was hemp. It was perfectly legal. Here is a, a, a U-Haul truck with a, with, a, with a haul full of 3,300 plus pounds of marijuana. Guy spent a month in jail. Lab tests came back. It was legal hemp. So you can't tell the difference between the two. They're indistinguishable. So let's look at hemp uh, in regards to it, w w what its history is. Um, it is known to have over 50,000 different uses in textiles, industrial textiles, paper, foods, building materials, and body care. I mean, everything from clothing, soaps and shampoos, printing, newspaper, uh, uh, you name it. So it has a tremendous amount of utility and use. And again, the only difference is its THC content is 0.3% or less, just not enough to get you to be worth getting, you have to smoke too much of it to get high. There's also evidence that there's material, although well, they've actually found material that dates 10,000 years made from hemp, and it is believed to be the first crop ever cultivated by mankind. And I thought that was sort of an interesting factoid. Its molecular structure, between cannabidiol and tetrahydrocannabinol, which you see here. The, uh, the cannabidiol is the CBD, which is the hemp, and you see it has an extra hydrogen atom. Uh, you look over at the hydrocannabinol, uh, and you see that's missing. There's some minor other differences, but they're, they're, they're ver their molecular structure or is very, 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 very similar. So what is the evidence of cannabis in health and disease. This study done uh, from uh, Israel. So cannabis preparations have been used in medicine for millennia. However, concerns over the dangers of abuse led to the banning of uh, the, the medicinal use of marijuana in most countries in the 30s. I showed you that ad. They really felt it was a scourge. They didn't want to use it. In 1840, Schlesinger was the first apparent investigator to obtain an active extract from the leaves and flower of hemp, but it wasn't until 1964 that THC, the major, of course, psych uh, psychoactive component of cannabis, was isolated in pure form, and its structure was then understood. Shortly after that was synthesized, it became widely available. These chemical advances led to an avalanche of publications on THC, as well as CBD, a, the, the, the non-psychoactive plant uh, uh, cannabinoid. However, concern about the dangers of abuse led to the ban banning of marijuana and its constituents from medicinal use in the United States and many other countries in the 30s and 40s. It took decades until cannabinoids came to be considered again as compounds of therapeutic value. And even now their use is still very highly restricted. Although that's from this study, um, that's changed because marijuana is getting, is, is legal a lot of places. I mean, marijuana is legal. CBD is just legal. Marijuana is legal a lot of places now. So recreational use. And there's some questions about its safety, but let's get into the study because they discussed that. There is some dependency associated with marijuana. Uh, it seems to be more prevalent if they started early, but the dependency is also uh, uh, generally found in personality types of addicted people. It can easily be su uh, successfully reversed. There's really no major withdrawal symptoms. Um, and it works on the brain, you know, reward process, you know, typical of uh, all of these, these things, probably alkaloids. It's the dopamine receptors, as we see in, in most of these kinds of things. There are some negative effects uh, to, to cannabis, um, and these can be related to alterations of attention and cognitive functions or other neuropsychological and behavioral effects. Again, found mostly if the person is either adolescent or began smoking in adolescence. That's kind of a key uh, uh, metric here. You know, it, 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 I would say like drinking, we, our drinking age is 21 
for a variety of reasons. Maybe that, you know, as this becomes legal, we need to also, more legal in more places, uh, we may have to make sure that there's some kind of age associated with them. People are gonna get it. I was getting alcohol when I was 13 years old. Um, there is some electro, uh, uh, electrophysiological, uh, uh, electrophysiological measures uh, have revealed long-term deficits and attention among cannabis users, impairment uh, in both cognitive function and mood following cannabis use. However, as it says here, the other studies did not really support that. So there's not strong evidence that you really have electrophysiological or cognitive or mood dysfunction with cannabis use that just isn't there. Um, there are some studies that have shown evidence uh, that cannabis use may trigger an acute uh, uh, schizophrenic psychosis. Um, that seems odd. I would say it's probably laced with something. Now, this was one that really got my attention. A motivational syndrome. I don't really think that exists, but it was described in 1960 among patients with a history of long-time cannabis use. That sounds like one of those made-up syndromes, a motivational syndrome. So it's a stoner. So we're going to say he has a motivation. We have to give somebody a diagnosis, so that's it. The data from other studies, however, did not support this hypothesis. So again, the, the data is very mixed and it was very biased towards the time. Most of these studies were done at a time when the country was very divided amongst between hippies and between preppies and you know who used pot and who didn't and all this kind of stuff. But cannabis use, more abuse, can cause acute pancreatitis. Uh, although the exact mechanism remains unknown, and this was published in 2007, and that's actually fairly decent evidence that it can happen. It's a very low percentage, but it can happen. Cannabis has been known for centuries to increase appetite and food consumption. We get the munchies, I heard. A friend of mine told me that. Uh, in animals, the CB1 receptor antagonism decreases motivation for pal palatable foods. And this was a very important study because they were able to take animals that they, there was indulgent food for them and there was good food for them. And if they used this cannabis, they were hungry, but they more preferentially went for the good food. But when they weren't high, they went for the more palatable food. So that was kind of strange, I thought. Uh, there is this drug, uh, Ramonabrant, or Ramonabant rather, is a drug derived from cannabis and approved in the EU for weight loss. Um, it also was very strong in increasing HDL, your good cholesterol, uh, reducing triglycerides, and increase in plasma adiponectin levels, which that's very important for uh, uh, glucose control. Surprisingly, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration has declined to approve Remomabant, I'll say it right, primarily due to its slightly slight potential to enhance anxiety and suicidal thoughts. I think that sounds like a crock to me again, but it's slight, you know, they're not going to approve it. And there are a lot of people who this could potentially benefit because obesity, you know, I think that that carries, my view is it's probably gonna carry a higher risk than is this drug. Um, but there's also the concern about the litigious nature of our country. And that may be one of the reasons why they are not wanting to, um, to, uh, to approve that drug. Because if somebody does commit suicide having been on it, you know it's going to be a class action lawsuit and the company will be out of business. So it's also very good for anorexia, especially for patients uh, who have very bad nausea and vomiting associated with cancer and AIDS. Uh, so it improved their appetite uh, very much as well. It's also uh, very effective for anore anorexia associated with light weight loss in patients who also had AIDS. Uh, and increased appetite, improvement in mood, and decreased nausea. 
it, there, are, there is evidence that cannabis, specifically the THC, uh, has been used in the past for pain relieving, as a pain relieving substance in our history. Uh, evidence does suggest that it may provide use, may pr prove useful in pain modulation by inhibiting neuronal transmission in pain pathways. However, again, these results do not support an overall benefit of THC in pain and quality of life in patients with refractory neuropathic pain. However, the first cannabis-based Sativex, which is a drug, has been approved for use for neuropathic pain due to multiple sclerosis in Canada. So there's not good evidence to suggest THC is good for uh, uh, neuronal pain, refractory neuronal pain, but with multiple sclerosis, it seems like it is. And you'd have to dig deeper into these studies. My point of this I'm trying to make is that the evidence is very conflicted. It's not strong either direction. But if you're a believer, it works. And I don't think we can underestimate the placebo effect, but I'm not really sure. And, you know, getting high just feels good, I guess. So, so my friend has frequently told me. Um, it is, this is, uh, this is cannabis, an inflammatory mediator, autoimmune response, uh, demyelination, and axonal damage controller or mitigator, it mediates it, in multiple sclerosis. CBD has been shown to exert potent anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effects. And so if you think about um, cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis, is, 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 is essentially an inflammatory process. So oral treatments with low doses of THC help to inhibit atherosclerotic progression in the mice model. So let's go back and do a full circle and talk about the benefits of marijuana as it is described in the uh, current uh, marketing literature. It fights cancer anxiety and ADHD, relieves arthritis, treats migraines, treats glaucoma, epileptic seizures, prevents Alzheimer's, bipolar disorder. And you can see on the right, more of that kind of stuff. Uh, calms those with Tourette's and OCD. Helps relieve PMS. That's pretty impressive. That's an impressive uh, 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 item. Very impressive medication. Here we see health benefits of CBD oil. You can use it for, now this is of course for external use only, but it's been used for asthma. It's been used, again, I don't know how, you can't put an inhaler, I don't think. Cancer, brain, well-being, spinal cord injury, eyes, heart, intestines, stomach, bone structure. And here, this is a very interesting one because it talks about THC and CBD. So the THC is an orange dot, CBD is the green square, protects against cancer, both of them. Reduces nausea, both of them. Reduces pain, both of them. Causes drowsiness and increases appetite. Well, that's only the CBD. I, I, I don't know about you, but I've always heard that, that my friend, when he told me he got high, he got tired. So I don't know, I can't figure that out. Increases appetite, that's only the THC. Antidepressant relief, spasms. I mean, you just go on, it, I'm not gonna say any more about it. It's even an antimicrobial and an antibacterial. We shouldn't be washing our hands with, and that's the antimicrobial is the THC. We should be washing our hand, we should just be scrubbing with weed. I mean, really. So, I mean, it concerns me. It concerns me you know, as just a, a citizen, as a parent, as a grandparent, um, I'm sure there's many of you out there as well. Um, I, I think that uh, before we embark on using these products, we have to really think about Clark Stanley. We have to go back and really consider what some people will do to make money. Now, do I think there are health benefits to some of the, if they, could, if they could perhaps synthesize certain elements of it? Do I think CBD oil does have some benefits? I think it does. 
I think it does for certain things. Well, I don't think we know what those are, but I don't think it's good for fighting cancer. I don't think it's good for uh, 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 all these other things. Smoking weed, whether it be, now is it the CBD or the THC? I really don't know, that benefits uh, people with glaucoma by lowering their intraocular pressure, but can that be given in a different way? Can we, I mean, like I said, plants and botanicals and molds and all of this stuff, has, we, have, we have extracted different substances from them for years. Look at the, 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 the opium poppy. Uh, I mean, you know, the poppy uh, that where we get the opium from and then of course the heroin. It really just depends on the extraction, the processing, a whole bunch of, uh, of things that go through that. And I, so I think the substances contained in there do have value somewhere with some things and probably even today have some value. If you have HIV AIDS or you have cancer and you're on chemotherapy and you're sick and you're retching and you can't eat and you smoke this stuff and your appetite comes back, then it works for you. And I think you should use it. Um, is there another way to, again, deliver it besides, you know, I mean, I guess they have edibles, but if you're throwing up, you don't want to eat edibles. So you have to smoke it. Is there another way to do this that works? I, I like a patch. I really don't know. I'm sure they're working on all these things. But to say that it does all of those things, which is in the contemporary, you know, sort of psyche of the public out there at large, um, uh, I, I, I question the validity of all of this because the evidence is just simply not there. That's how I feel. So that's my talk. You can open the phone lines. John, any comments? about this on um, so many different levels actually i happen to know firsthand a lot about a lot of what you're talking about firsthand meaning close close friends family members and um you know and it's all transpired in the last 12 to 24 months i have friends who have serious cancer and um i have also um uh well i can tell you a quick story uh, about really you, something I don't think you mentioned. Uh, I don't know if you did, but uh, you know a lot of this research started in in the veterinary world actually for animals. Mm -hmm. The uh, CBD. I'm talking about the CBD. I'm not talking about. Uh, I don't know much about. Uh, first of all, nothing to do with smoking, and I know all the benefits it helps some people in certain ways. The psychosis things are actually beneficial. Seizures, uh, people appetites. But let me tell you what I do know firsthand, um, because I have friends that have done it and are doing it. <clears throat> I had last year a very close friend of mine who was diagnosed with a golf ball sized cancer on his liver and in his lungs, out of the blue. And immediately was swept away to say, you need you know, the cancer treatments of today, radiation and chemotherapy. He said, uh, let me think about it. He made some phone calls to another friend of mine who had, I guess, connections. My friend went out to California or Colorado and got with a very serious, like you said, the refinement and the way that the CBD oil must be uh, distilled, I guess. It has to be done correctly. If you, There's so much out there now because it's not highly regulated. People are taking all kinds of stuff. You have no idea. If you get the proper stuff, and the point is, you were talking about different avenues of administration. When you have cancer, or when you need high doses, I'm talking of CBD, non-THC, you need it to be given the correct stuff and it needs to be given to you in a suppository, not just two or three drops under the tongue. That is good also, by the way. I have friends doing that. And I had a friend did the uh, high dose THC that the place that he went to recommended under a doctor's care also, by the way. Took the CBD for six weeks, twice a day, uh, uh, through a suppository, came back to the doctor, both cancers on the liver and lung vanished, gone. Not just shrunk 50%. I know, I know a number of people like that too. I, um, now I do know it's helping people with their symptoms enormously. If you have mm -hmm. radiation and chemotherapy and you take the high dose uh, suppository 
it makes the person feel a lot of the things you listed they're feeling a well-being mm -hmm. they don't have the nausea their attitude their outlook on life enormously improved i know a friend who's been doing this now for three years and mm -hmm. went off it for a few months drastic change could hardly get out of bed went back on it drastically back up gardens every day and basically the person is extremely terminal and has got cancer everywhere but the the way that it makes this person feel is remarkable i'll tell you another quick story we have a little uh dog we have a, a yorkshire terrier mix with a shih tzu two and a half years ago he's not very old only seven years old one of his legs he just wouldn't he's almost stopped walking on it he would hop around on three legs barely put the one paw down and i noticed it we went to a vet the vet took x-rays said he's already developing early stage arthritis and they gave us the uh the typical pills for arthritis what do you call it the uh the things all runners take the, the uh, cox 2 the cock the uh yes. the cox I 2 dose, inhibitors yeah. I dose, didn't touch him wasn't helping him i went online and bought some other stuff to add to it that, yeah yeah and i uh, wasn't touching him the, the dog got to the point where he hardly would even want to walk around just lost his activity he was gaining weight went to another vet we moved to another town as you know i'm a traveler went to a veterinary said the same thing said well he's just got early stage arthritis and and so we were reading and we went to like you said the uh the, the the cbd is basically legal everywhere you go and it's in almost all of your grooming and pet stores by the way again you have to buy the right stuff what we did we give him three drops on one treat a day joe this dog is a new dog mm -hmm. he yes it does have anti-inflammatory properties it does but right. it, it has he, to be you know you you in that setting on that on that dog right and i think that that's those these stories are true i don't doubt any of it um at all but you can't have something that works like that but if the dog uh developed let's say um uh diabetes it's going to work on that too the dog uh, uh, became, uh, 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 I don't know, had some other, one of these other syndromes that I had on there. Um, it's going to work on that. Uh, or, you know, got renal failure. It's going to work on that. I mean, you look at the, the, the list, John, and yeah, it's, I don't uh, it's, I, I don't know. it's a I little mean, bit I, on I, the um, ridiculous side. You know, I mean, I, be I frank know. with I, you. I'm just telling you. And so it's I an anti-diabetic. It says it right there. You know, and I'll tell you something that's very important that people need to know is CBD if extracted cbd itself has no psych, psych uh, no 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 uh, uh psychoactive properties at all sure. so if you extract it from hemp it's legal but if you extract it from marijuana even though it's just cbd it's illegal mm. which okay. is crazy now the Hemp has a higher concentration of it, and CBD is the same thing. It's the same CBD because it's the same, essentially the same plant. But it just th that was a side. But I, I think that um, I think it does. It, it, I think the anti-inflammatory properties are there, but it has to be used properly in the right setting for the right problem. If you have seriatic seriatic uh, arthritis, um, which can cause enormous problems in your joints. Mm -hmm. And people decide, well, this works. This is what I'm going to take. You may feel better for real. You may feel better because of placebo effect. Mm -hmm. We don't know. It's never been studied, never been proven, never truly been, been vetted out. Or you may end up with a far worse disease than had you gone and gotten conventional medicine and not just relied on um, what could potentially be a good product for some things. I'll bet you Clark Stanley's ointment worked for people because there was mm -hmm. huge demand for it. So people thought it worked, John. Can't argue the point. And well, there was I a mean, tremendous amount of resistance to take it off the market. And it didn't have anything in it. There's, a, there's an 18 to 22% placebo effect with anything. So anecdotal, you, you have to take with a grain of salt. And I'll tell you the last two things. I have two very close family members who have had, you know, one guy, uh, he's about our age, he had an old football injury in his knee and it's hurt him forever and he works through it, he's a construction guy. And um, somebody else I know 
had a similar problem, just, just acquired over time as a foot orthopedic, I was going to a foot orthopedic person for a long time. Under the tongue drops, again, you have to get the proper stuff. Both people who were dealing with a lot of pain chronically, it is completely taken it away 100%. Now, um, when they go off of it, or in fact, one of my friends, who has the knee problem decided, because he doesn't live near me, he decided, oh, I'll, I ran out, I'll just go to the store and get some other one. And he got some other one, and guess what? It didn't help him at all. He had to come back to getting, I, I just happen to know a really good good uh, producer of this in Colorado, mm -hmm. and it's under medical advice, you have to talk to a doctor and so on. And he does the pure, healthy, best distiller, distilled product of CBD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, these are three or four 100% of my experience, and I don't need it personally, I don't have any issues, but uh, everything that I've seen, it's all developed here in the last 12 to 24 months, mm -hmm. has helped. Now, I know several people who've tried it and several of their pets that they've tried it, and it did not help them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's just hard to say, you know, concurrent treatments with that and something else, or just that and it just happens to work for them you know you have to have the right cannabinoid receptors right in your body in order mm -hmm. for them to work is there something that you know turns those on or makes them more more receptive or less to you know the uh, the administration of that medication you know i simply again i i don't know but i do know that the research that's going on now may help to answer some of these questions um, but I think that as a cure-all for a hundred different diseases and all you have to take is either this or that, um, mm -hmm. seems pretty far-fetched to me and irresponsible in regards to um, informing our, uh, our, our public, our citizens, about uh, treating themselves with what could be potentially, in their case, snake oil now in somebody else's it may be great but i think we need to get science to vet this stuff out and, and finally i think here in the last few years i think that's happening and it's always damaging to any medicine or product or any whatever that comes out and it seems to cure some endless list of things i mean that's that's not helpful whoever uh thinks that they're helping promote their product or their their item by saying, you know, it's almost nothing, it doesn't help, is almost completely shot themselves in the foot because it's just not possible. Well, no, one. they don't. Two, it, no, it, no, it works it. just, and, and no, don't it's it. not true. And therefore, your, your product falls on its face. People are desperate. They see that big, long list. Look, they saw that big, long list on Clark Stanley's product. I mean, it was yeah. for everything from, from lame back to toothaches. I mean, it was everything. And yeah. so it didn't hurt him. In fact, he, 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 he was a rich man very rich and so that's i think what happens is that uh the money um interferes with good public policy and i think that's uh potentially happening i'm not saying it doesn't work i'm just saying that there is very mixed evidence yeah. as to the benefits and risks of in particular thc i think cbd carries with an extremely low risk if any um, and so I think that's worth taking, even whether it works or not. I don't think it's going to hurt you. Uh, THC, on the other hand, I think is a different, uh, different thing altogether. So, you know, but I don't think people should also believe that this is a panacea, that the CBD oil under my tongue is going to, it cured his cancer, it will cure mine. Um, right. Or, uh, you know, it, 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 uh, it, will, it will solve my alcoholism or it will do something else. Because now if it does, and it has a placebo effect on an alcoholic and they stop drinking because of CBD oil, look, great, take more. That'd be fantastic. But does that mean that really is what did it? And clearly the answer to that, I think we both agree, is no. There's no proof. You know, back in the, the days of the, the gentleman you were talking about uh, there in the history, uh, because placebo effect is 18 to 22% of anybody who takes anything will have the the, the suggested effect um, without the media and all the other things to, to, to downplay it and stuff, word could get out very powerfully that I took this thing and it did such and such for me, yeah. you know, and, and, and uh, the placebo effect has been around forever. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, 
I do, back to the one uh, person I know who's actually been taking the high dose uh, CBD oil with suppositories for almost two and a half years now, it has not cured uh, this person's cancer, but it has made them feel enormously better, better. and mm -hmm. the coping uh, mm -hmm. aspect of it has been hugely improved. And I think but, that's you know, very important. That's very yeah. important and very worthwhile, definitely. Definitely mm -hmm. something that, you know, and I'm glad for that, certainly. Whether it's, regardless of whether it's placebo, which I don't think it is, I actually think it does work. I think CBD mm -hmm. has medicinal value. We just don't know how, how much, maybe there's something else to it that needs to be synthesized or extracted. Maybe it has to be in combination with something else that we're just not familiar with yet. Um, the route of administration may have something to do with it, how long it lasts and whether it can be time released. And there's just so many factors involved with developing and delivering medications that uh, you just can't say three drops under the tongue works for everybody for all of this and that's it. I think we just don't know enough. But I do, I well, think I, it's an anti-inflammatory. Do I think it's an anti-emetic? Do I think it works to um, help uh, people's appetites that they're in? I think the evidence for that's strong and I think so it some, does. There's some pretty good neurological evidence in the area of um, seizures and uh, things along with some psychological disorders. I, I know of in children and maybe true in adults too. Um, you know, under a doctor's care and, and given whatever it is you're supposed to take, whatever route you're supposed to take it and whatever dose you're supposed to take. I mean, if you just go off half cock willy nilly, like you're saying, I'm just gonna take this and I'm you know, never gonna have a heart disease or kidney, or whatever you think's gonna happen. You have no idea if you're doing anything, but I mean, there's a lot of uh, neurologists and people out there that, that, that really you know, study, study the medicine part that mm -hmm. are they're showing that, you know, so, but the studies need to emerge. We just don't, it's very hard to say. You know? Right, I agree. I agree with you. There needs to be evidence, right? I mean, at the end of the day, there just needs to be evidence. Either the anecdote, now the anecdotal evidence seems strong, mm -hmm. but you know, I mean, there's really just no hard, fast, concrete evidence. And I understand that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, and I get all of that, and sometimes it's very difficult to do these kinds of studies. But I don't see this as being that hard of a thing to actually study. Um, so I do think that, that evidence should exist and should exist now or in the very near future supporting the use of cannabinoids uh, for various different diseases that have enough power and weight behind them that people can say, yes, this is, a, this is an appropriate use for this medication. I think it's going to take some time, John. That's how I think. But of let course, it's legal about, so people can use it how they want. Let me ask you about the A-motivation aspect. A-motivational syndrome? Might, That's a good one. Yeah, for, for people who smoke, just the, the regular guy on the street who, who, who smokes marijuana. Now, you know, I um I would tend to believe there there's some pretty strong and, and most of the people that I ever knew that smoked frequently they definitely had issues with motivation. However, I will tell you about two seasoned adults of, of age who smoke marijuana from morning to night like they're cigarettes and they thrive in their jobs and have no issues whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I know two people in my life like that. But but I would say the vast majority of young kids that I knew when we were doing it, they suffered from some, some significant amount of what I would call a motivation. So mm -hmm. whether that's anecdotal or proven or not. But, but that just may be their personality. And they gravitate to that drug because it, it, it reinforces their underlying uh, psychology. You know, we don't know. Or it's because they started using it at an earlier age, remember the yeah. studies sort of reflected that. They started all later, it didn't have that same neuropsychological effect. Mm -hmm. And so I think those are good questions. There's a question by Karen uh, Pertuz. It says, do users of these kinds of therapies, uh, more specifically probably the THC, not the CBD, 
Um, but do they require larger amounts of hypnotics, muscle relaxants, and drugs when exposing, uh, to, when they're going under anesthesia, basically? Do they require a higher level of anesthesia like you would find with uh, uh, chronic alcohol abusers? Well, I don't know the answer to that, but I know that we, I know we probably treat a lot of people in cardiac surgery nowadays that, that, are, that are frequent marijuana smokers, and I have never heard that, but I am not an expert, to, it's a good one to ask, but mm -hmm. what are your thoughts about that? Um, you know, I don't know, intuitively, without, I mean, and I'm just giving this as, a, as, a, as my best guess, I wouldn't think so. Um, I think it's a different mechanism of action. Um, so I don't necessarily think it would work. I think most of what they give don't really go to that same, that same center of the brain uh, and certainly not with the paralytics. It's not going to have that effect. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't think so, but I don't really know the answer, Karen. Uh, but if you send me an email to contact at perfusioneducation.com, I'll find out the answer and email it to you. So if you do that, I'll get that answer to you. So I'll ask an yeah. anesthesiologist probably if uh, do they know yeah. if you know if this would affect their anesthesia regimen or plan on a patient who was a chronic uh, marijuana smoker or, or or brownie eater or edibles or gummy marijuana gummy eater or whatever else. I mean, there's, it's it's amazing to me at how how simple it is to uh, to uh, to use these substances now. Yeah, I mean, it's really exploded exploded on the scene here in the last five years or, or even the last two years mm -hmm. uh, with, with the accessibility of what and the packaging that they've come up with. It's just mind boggling. Yes, the absolutely. And the administrations of foods mm -hmm. and whatever they, mm -hmm. whatever they come up with, it's just mm -hmm. about our limits mm -hmm. of the imagination, really. And that's what concerns me, John. That's that is there. There, there goes the thing. This is I guess I'm sort of really giving almost a, a social science uh, 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 lecture here versus just a, but I, I hope it was entertaining at least. Um, my philosophy is just my philosophy and I respect, uh, that, that y you may feel differently than I do. Uh, but I do feel there is some value. I just don't think that value is really well understood. And I think that it's like a lot of things it's being marketed, uh, in a way that is attractive, um, and perhaps making claims that can't be supported by evidence and therefore I believe there are desperate people who uh, may be hurt by it and that concerns me and that's that's just my 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 philosophy uh, doesn't make me right uh, but it's how I feel and I respect anybody that feels differently because I think people have the right we are a free will society and they have the right to make whatever decisions they want to make uh, and live free so yeah that's how I feel well, I think one thing is pretty conclusive, and that is on the young person developing brain, and probably have to stretch that to at least 19, if not 21, maybe in some people's cases. But mm -hmm. for a, a 13, 14, 15, all the way through 18-year-old uh, uh, young person to be smoking it with any type of frequency, um, they're kidding themselves if you think that it's not harming the permanent long-term development of your brain, there's so many studies on that that have that have shown it. I know that you know people don't want to hear that and people don't want to believe that, but uh, I think there's a ton of evidence. I think the I same thing. Ever, I don't think there's ever been a study that has shown that wasn't the case. Actually, it's the same with alcohol. It's the same right. with you know pretty much any drug. When your brain is developing, you you don't need those things being uh, uh, being uh, added into the mix. It just confuses all of the the processes that are taking place. So listen. So with all that said, I again I hope it was fun at least. Your talk was fantastic, um, and uh, I will look forward to seeing everyone tomorrow. We're going to have Dr. Simpkins on. And he is going to be talking. What is the title of his talk specifically? Do you have it? Let me get the title because it's a really good title. Yeah, it's a novel approach for. Let me let me let me just pull it up so I say it. Uh, I, I don't mess it up. And tomorrow's Wednesday. Novel approach for treating vasoplegia syndrome and shock. And uh, he has a nitric oxide absorbing. Uh, material and I'm going to ask him tomorrow uh, whether or not and I didn't I haven't asked him already and he's probably not watching now so I feel like I can say this um, I won't I won't I won't preview it to him 
but I wanna know about, if you remember the perf web we did with uh, Dr. Platt, when he was talking about his, uh, uh, his heme particle, nanoparticle, that was uh, basically heme in, uh, in, a, in a glucose molecule that was very, very small. It was a nanoparticle that could be infused and get through, perfused through clots, very good for ARDS, all of these things because that molecule was able to move, molecule was able to move more freely. Um, so it was like if you had an occlu acute occlusion from a thrombosis, the, this particle could make it through that clot and perfuse the distal tissue so you would reduce the size uh, and, uh, and damage from the stroke. Um, and of course, that was an interesting talk. Uh, he was certainly very smart. Um, and I don't know where that's going to, but it's interesting technology. So it was essentially an artificial blood that was different than what the other ones previously uh, 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 designed were and how it worked. So it was unique in the sense that it was this heme and glucose molecule. Um, and now Dr. Uh, Simpkins is talking about uh, excess nitric oxide production and how to control that, which is thought to be the cause of vasoplegia syndrome, which will lead to shock, of course, and being able to clear that is very beneficial in those patients. And he's a really super smart guy, been working on this project for probably 20 years. I know him very well. Uh, and he's a wonderful person, wonderful presenter. So I'm looking forward to his talk tomorrow. So maybe you could tune in, John. It would be great if you could and maybe ask a question because I'm sure I'm going to have a lot of questions for him too. Well, are you, are you ready for this little bit of news? Yeah. Um, I've been working on my thesis, and my thesis is vasoplegia following cardiopulmonary bypass. Well, I'll bet you'll watch it. I'll bet you wa will watch this program then. Oh, I'm going to watch for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you, will, you too. You should watch it too. All right. I want to thank everybody. We'll see you tomorrow from 5 to 6 Central U.S. time. It'll be Dr. Simpkins, Novel Approach for Treating Vasoplegia Syndrome and Shock. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please email them to me. I promise I will respond to them. And we will, John, I can't thank you enough again. You're a, 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 a gem. And uh, I appreciate everything that you do for us. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again. And congratulations on the thesis. I'll, I'll, I'll look, I hopefully you'll be able to, after you have had your, your opportunity to defend that and uh, 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 you get your, your degree, you'll be able to uh, share that thesis with us on this program. I would really love that. Well, it'll be about a year from now, so it'll be great education for all of us tomorrow, and I'll be definitely tuning in. I'm probably I'll, calling it. I appreciate that so very much. Okay, everybody, see you tomorrow, same time, same place.